Recurrent Neural Network RNN. Hello everyone, let's start the class. Okay, let's talk about the recurrent neural network. The recurrent neural network can actually do what we talked about in the previous class. Sequence labeling. In the end, we'll talk about the difference between them. The example we are going to give is slot filling. We know that AI customer service is very popular now. For instance, AI ticket booking systems. These customer services or ticket booking systems would often use slot filling. So, what does slot filling refer to? Slot filling refers to, for example, if someone tells your booking system, I would like to arrive Taipei on November 2nd, then your system should automatically know that. There are some slots in itself. For example, in the booking system, there should be a slot named destination and another slot named time of arrival. Your system needs to automatically know the slot every word listed here belongs. Your system should know that Taipei belongs to the destination slot and it should also know that November 2nd belongs to the slot of time of arrival. As for the other words, they don't belong to any slot. How do we solve this problem? Actually, for this problem. Of course, you can also use a feedforward neural network to solve it. In other words, all stack one. Feedforward neural network. And its input is a word. For example, if you turn Taipei into a vector and throw it into this neural network. If you want to throw a word into a neural network, you must first transform it. Into a vector. How do we represent a word using a vector? There are too many ways to do it, and the most naive way is one of n encoding. I think we don't need to elaborate this more. Of course, you could use word vector to represent a word. Or, there are also some methods beyond one of n encoding. For example, sometimes, if you only use one of n encoding to describe a word, you will encounter some problems. Since there are so many words you may have never seen before, you will need to add one more dimension to the one of n encoding. This dimension represents other, and all the words not in our dictionary will be classified into other. For example, Gandalf is not in our dictionary. So it is classified as other. Or Sauron is not in this dictionary, so it is also classified into this vector. You can also use the letters of a certain vocabulary to express its vector. If you use the n-gram of the letter of a word to represent that vector, you won't have a problem where some words are not in the dictionary. For example, you have a word called apple. In the word apple, app appears in it. PPL appears, and PLE appears. In this vector, the dimension corresponding to app is 1. The dimensions corresponding to PPL and PLE are 1 and the others are 0. Anyway, suppose we can represent a word as a vector. Then you can throw this vector into a feedforward network. As a result, you will hope that your output is a probability distribution in the slot filling task. This probability distribution represents the probability of which slots does. The input word belongs. For example, the probability that Taipei belongs to the destination, and the probability that Taipei belongs to the time of departure, etc. However, this alone is not enough for feedforward network. To solve this problem, why? Suppose, a user says. Arrive Taipei on November 2nd. Arrive is other, Taipei is destination, on is other. November and 2nd are all time. But if another. User said, leave Taipei on November 2nd, then Taipei this time. Should be place of departure, it should be place of departure, rather than destination. But for the neural network, when the input is the same thing. The output should be the same thing. When you input the word Taipei. Either the output has the highest probability of being a destination. Or place of departure. Only one of them can have the highest probability. You can't make it sometimes departure has the highest probability, and sometimes destination has the highest probability. So, what should we do? 
At this time, we hope that our neural network has memory. Suppose the neural network has memory. It remembers that before it had seen this red Taipei. It has already seen the word arrive. And it remembers that before it had seen this green Taipei. It has already seen the word leave. It can produce different outputs. Based on the context of a paragraph, so if we let our neural network. If the neural network has memory, it can solve the problem of inputting the same word. But there are different outputs. Okay, this kind of neural network with memory is called recurrent neural network. Its abbreviation is RNN. In the recurrent neural network, every time our hidden layer, every time the neuron in our hidden layer produces outputs, the outputs will all be stored in memory. Here, we use blue squares to represent the memory. When there are outputs from the neurons in these hidden layers, they will be stored in these blue squares. Next time. When there are inputs, these hidden layer. These neurons will not only considered. The input, x1 and x2, it will also consider. The values in these memories. For the RNN, aside from x1 and x2. The values stored in memory. A1 and A2, will also affect the output. For a better understanding, I will give an example directly. Assume that all the weights of the network on the graph are 1. And all neurons have no bias value. We also assume that all activation functions are linear. This way the calculations won't be too complicated. Now, suppose our input is a sequence. Our input is 1 1 1 1 2 2. Then we input the sequence 1 1 1 1 2 2 into this recurrent neural network. What will happen? First of all, before you start to use this recurrent neural network, you have to give the memory initial values. You have to give the memory. Before putting anything in it, you have to give it initial values. For instance, we assume that the values in memory are zero before putting anything in it. Now we input the first input, 1 1. What will happen next? For this neuron. In addition to receiving input 1 1. It also received 0 from the memory. And because we said that all the weights are 1. So the output is 2, and this neuron's output is also 2. What's next? Next, because all the weights are 1. The outputs of the red neurons are 4. When we input 1 1, the outputs are 4 4. Then, recurrent neural network will store the outputs of the green neurons to the memory. As a result, the value in the memory is updated to 2. This 2 will be written to memory, this 2 will be written to memory. The values in the memory are updated to 2. After that, we will input 1 and 1. What will the green neurons output be this time? It has four inputs. 1 1 and 2 2, then the weights are all 1, so you add 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. And the results are 6. Lastly, the outputs of red neurons are 6 plus 6 equal 12, so when the inputs are 1 1. When you input 1 1 for the second time, the outputs are 12 12. So for recurrent neural network, even if you input the same thing, even if you give it exactly the same input, in this case, it is 1 and 1. Even if you give it exactly the same input, it will be 1 and 1 in this case, its outputs may be different. Because the values in the memory are different. What about the original values, the outputs of the green neurons are 6 and 6. These 6 and 6 will be stored into the memory, and they will be stored into the memory. So 2 will be updated and becomes 6. Next, our inputs are. 2 and 2, assuming the inputs are 2 2, every green neurons here. We'll consider 4 inputs, 2 and 2 and 6 and 6. So what is 6 plus 6 plus 2 plus 2? The answer is 16. The outputs of the red neurons are 32. So when inputs are 2 and 2, the outputs are 32. When using recurrent neural network, one very important thing is. The sequence of the input. 
is not independent when recurrent neural network is considering it. If you change the order of the input sequence arbitrarily, for example, move 2 and 2 to the top, the output will be completely different. Therefore, recurrent neural network will consider the order of the input sequence. If we want to use recurrent neural network to solve the problem of slot filling, it would look like this. One user said, arrive Taipei on November 2nd. Then, arrive becomes a vector and we throw it into the neural network. The output of the hidden layer of neural network is written here as A1. This A1 is the output of a row of neurons, so it is actually a vector. Then we generate Y1 based on this A1. This Y1 is the probability of which slot arrive belongs. Then, A1 will be stored in the memory. And then, Taipei will become the input. Then this hidden layer would consider both the input Taipei and A1, which is stored in the memory, to get A2. Then we generate Y2 according to A2. Y2 is the probability of which slot Taipei belongs. This process will be repeated again and again. We then store A2 in the memory and throw on into the RNN. The hidden layer will consider both the vector of the word on and A2, which is stored in memory, to get A3 and generate Y3 according to A3. It represents the probability of which slot on belongs. A little reminder here is that someone may say there are three networks here after seeing this picture. However, this is not three networks, this is the same network. Being used three times at three different time period. I use the same color to represent the same weight here on purpose. The same weight is represented by the same color. I hope you can see it. So, after we have memory. The problem of inputting the same word but hoping for different outputs. Could be solved now. For example, if we both enter the word Taipei, because the red Taipei is after leave and the green Taipei is after arrive, and leave and arrive have different vectors. So the outputs of the hidden layer will be different. As a result, the values in the memory will be different. Although the X2s are exactly the same, but the values in the memory are different. So the outputs of the hidden layer will be different. The final outputs will also be different. Okay, this is the basic concept of recurrent neural network. Of course, you can arbitrarily design the architecture of recurrent neural network. Certainly, it can be deep. We just saw that recurrent neural network has only one hidden layer. It can surely be a deep recurrent neural network. For example, after we input x1, it can pass through one hidden layer, and then pass through a second hidden layer. Then it passed through many hidden layers, finally we get the the final output. All the outputs of each hidden layer will be stored in the memory. And at the next period of time, every hidden layer will read the values stored in the memory before. It will read the values stored in the memory before, and finally get the final output. This process continues. You can stack as many layers as you want. The recurrent neural network has different kinds of variants. What we have just talked about is called Elman network. If we save the value of the hidden layer for now and use it next time, then this is called Elman network. The other one is called Jordan network. Jordan network stores the output value of the entire network. Then it will use this value of output at the next point of time. It stores the value of the final output in the memory. The legend says that Jordan network can have a better performance because the hidden layer here has no target. So it's hard to control what kind of hidden information it will learn and what kind of things it put in the memory. But this why it has a target so we can have a better understanding of what we put in the memory. Also, recurrent neural network can be bidirectional. What does this mean? We just saw that in recurrent neural network. If you input a sentence, it will read from the beginning. 
Till the end of the sentence, assume that we use xt to represent every word in the sentence. It will read xt first, then xt plus 1, then xt plus 2. However, its reading direction can, in fact, be reversed. It can read xt plus 2 first, then xt plus 1, then xt. You can train a forward recurrent neural network and a backward recurrent neural network at the same time. Then take out the hidden layers from the two recurrent neural networks and connect them to an output layer to get the final Y. So you throw the output of the forward network when XT was the input and the output of backward network when XT was the input to the output layer and generate yt, and then generate yt plus 1, yt plus 2, and so on. The benefit of using bidirectional RNN is that when the network yields output, it considers a broader range. If you only have a forward network, when generating yt and yt plus 1, your network has only seen the part from x1 to xt plus 1. But if we use bidirectional RNN, when yt plus 1 is generated, your network not only considers all the inputs from x1 to xt plus 1, but also the inputs from the end of the sentence to xt plus 1. Your network now does consider the entire input sequence. Suppose you are doing slot filling task. Your network is equivalent to considering the entire sentence before deciding what the slot of each word should be. It will have better performance than the one which just considers half of the sentence. The recurrent neural network we just talked about is actually just the simplest version of recurrent neural network. That's actually just the simplest version. The memory we just talked about is the simplest. That is, we can store the value in memory at any time and read the value from memory at any time. But the more commonly used memory now is called the long short term memory. The abbreviation of this long short term memory is LSTM. This long short term memory is more complicated. This long short term memory has three gates. Considering outside world, when the other parts of the neural network when the output of a neuron wants to be written into the memory cell, it must pass through a gate, input gate, first. Only when the input gate is about to be opened, can you write the value into the memory cell. If it is locked up, there is no way to write the value into it from the other neurons. As for whether the input gate is open or closed, this is learned by neural network itself. So it can learn when to open the input gate and when to close the input gate by itself. What about the output? There is also an output gate in the output place. This output gate will decide whether other neurons can read the value from the memory or not. When the output gate is closed, there is no way to read the value. Only when the output gate is opened, can the value be read. This is the same as the input gate, when the output gate is open or Closed is learned by the network itself. There is a third gate, called forget gate. Forget gate decides that when to forget the things that were remembered in the past or to format the memory. When this forget gate formats the value stored in memory or to retain the stored value is learned by the network itself. The whole LSTM have four inputs and one output. What are these four inputs? One is the value you want to store it in the memory cell. But it may not be able to be stored, which depends on the input gate that decides whether to let this information pass through. And the signal that controls the input gate. And the signal that controls the output gate and the signal controls the forget gate. So an LSTM cell has four inputs, but it will only generate one output. There is a trivia here. Where do you think the dash should be placed? 
I put it here on the slide, but it doesn't mean that my slide is right. I might just suddenly find that I made a mistake and want to revise it. If you think this dash should be placed between long and short, raise your hands. No. If you think it should be placed between short and term, raise your hand. Okay, put your hand down. Yes, it should be placed between short and term. Sometimes I see someone put it between long and short. In fact, this doesn't make sense. It should be placed between short and term. Because it is actually a short term memory. It is just a relatively long short term memory. So according to this literal meaning, it is a relatively long short term memory. Because the recurrent neural network we mentioned previously. Its memory would be cleaned. At each moment. As long as a new input comes in every time. Recurrent neural network will wash out the memory, so this short term is very short. It only remembers things from the previous time point. But if it is a long short term memory, it can remember. Longer memory, as long as forget gate does not decide to format the memory. Its value can be stored. Okay, what about the memory cell? If you look at its formulation more closely, it looks like this. This is the input from the outside that needs to be stored into the cell. And this is the input gate. This is the forget gate. This is the output gate. Let's suppose that the input to be stored in the cell is called Z. The signal that controls the input gate is called Z. This so-called signal that controls the input gate is actually a scalar is also a value. We will talk about where this value comes from later. Anyway, there is a value here, which is regarded as the input of this cell, and this forget gate. There is one value, ZF, that controls it, and there is a value, ZO, that controls the output gate. After synthesizing these things, you will finally get an output. Write a here. Okay, suppose there is a value already stored the cell. Before inputting these four values, which called C. Now, suppose you want to input the input value, called Z. The three gates are controlled by Z, ZF, ZO respectively. What will output a look like? We put Z through an activation function. Get G, Z, then pass Z through. Another activation function, get F, Z. Over here. The activation function f these z, zf, zo pass through. Usually we choose sigmoid function. Its meaning is that. The output value of sigmoid function is between 0 to 1, and this value. Represents how much the gate is opened. If the output of f. The output of the activation function is 1, which means that the gate is now in an open state. On the contrary, it means that the gate is closed. Next, we multiply g z by the value of this input gate f z. That is g z asterisk f z. What about the z f of this forget gate? The z f signal is also passed through the sigmoid activation function. To get f z f, then we multiplied f z f by the value c stored in memory. To get c asterisk f z f. Then, add C asterisk F Z F to G Z asterisk F Z. Add these two together to get C. C is the new value stored in memory. The value stored in the new memory is C, so. According to the calculations so far, we can find that this F Z controls G Z. Deciding whether value can be inputted or not. Because when F Z equals zero. Then G Z asterisk F Z is equal to 0, as if there is no input. If F Z is equal to 1, then G Z is directly used as input. Then this F Z F is to decide whether we should. Wash out the value stored in memory. Assuming F Z F is 1. Assuming F Z F is 1. That is, when the forget gate is opened. When forget gate is opened. 
C will pass through it directly, which is equivalent to remembering the value stored before. If F ZF equals 0. That is, when the forget gate is closed. Now 0 is multiplied by the value of C, those values stored in the memory become 0. Then add these two values together. We add up these two values and write it to memory to get C. The switch of the forget gate is opposite to our intuitive thoughts. When the forget gate is opened, it represents remembering. When it is closed, it means forgetting. So I think its name is a bit weird, maybe it shouldn't be called forget gate. Anyway, it's customary to call it forget gate. Well, pass this C through H to get H C. Next, there is an output gate here. This output gate is controlled by ZO. And get F ZO by passing through F. If F ZO is 1, then we will multiply F ZO by H C. If F ZO is 1, it means H C can pass this output gate. If F ZO is 0, it means that the output will become 0, which means the value stored in memory cannot be passed through output gate and to be read. Maybe you still don't understand it very well, so later, I plan to make a manual LSTM. I have never seen manual LSTM anywhere else. So you can think that I made this slide for a long time. Let's talk about the example we want to give first. Our example is like this. In the network, there is only one LSTM cell. Our inputs are all three-dimensional vectors. Outputs are all one-dimensional vectors. What is the relationship between this three-dimensional vectors and the value in the output and the memory? This relationship is like. Support that. When the value of the second dimension x2 is 1. The value of x1 will be written to memory. When x2 is 1, the value of x1 will be stored in memory. Assuming that the value of x2 is minus 1. Memory will be reset. The value stored in memory will be forgotten. Assuming that x3 is equal to 1. You will open the output gate and you can see the output. So. Suppose we originally stored the value in memory as 0. When 1 is here. When x2 equals 1, 3 will be stored in memory. The value obtained here becomes 3. Then 1 appears again here. So 4 will be stored in memory, so we get 7. x3 equals 1, so 7 will be output. There is a minus 1 here. Which will wash out the value in memory so if you see minus 1, the value at the next time point will become 0. Then when you see 1, 6 will be stored in, so the value you get is 6. Here, 1 is the output, so the value obtained is 6. Then let's do the calculation. This is a memory cell, an LSTM memory cell. We know there are 4 inputs in in the memory cell of LSTM. All these 4 inputs are scalar. Where did these 4 input scalars come from? These four scalars are the result obtained from the three-dimensional vectors we input. After the linear transform, you just multiply these three vectors by these three values plus bias. You can get the input here. Then these three values. Multiply them by three weights and add bias to get the inputs. And so on. As for these input values, x1, x2, x3. Which value should be multiplied, and what should be the value of bias? It is learned through training data and gradient descent. We are just assuming that we already know what these values are. Then I use these inputs to get the output. Let's do the calculations. But before the calculations. According to its input, according to these parameters. Let's analyze the results we might get. You can see here. x1 is multiplied by 1, everything else is multiplied by 0, so. Here, we just use x1 as the input. Then we look at the input gate. It is x2 asterisk 100. Bias is minus 10, that is to say, when x2 has no value. 
Because the bias is minus 10, the input gate is usually closed. If bias is minus 10, then after activation function, which is sigmoid here, its value will be close to 0. Hence the input gate is closed. Then if x2 has a value, it will be greater than the bias of minus 10. For example, if x2 is 1, it will be larger than the bias. At this time, the input will be a large positive number. The input gate is then opened. What about the forget gate? Forget gate is usually opened, you will find that since its bias is 10, it is usually opened. Therefore, it always remembers things. Only when x2 is a large negative value, it will overwhelm the bias 10 and close the forget gate. What about the output gate? The output gate is usually closed because its bias is a large negative number. If x3 has a large positive input value, it can overwhelm the bias and turn on the output gate. So let's walk through this framework with some inputs. We assume that G and H are both linear for the convenience of computation. Suppose the initial value stored in the memory is 0. OK, let's enter the first vector 310. What will happen to input vector 310? 3 is multiplied by 1, so the value entered here is 3. Then 1 times 100 minus 10, so the input gate here is approximately equal to 1. So it is opened. 1 times 3, the value obtained after passing the input gate is 3. What about forget gate? The input vector is 310. Since the input vector is 310, the forget gate is opened. Multiply 0 by 1 and add 3, so the forget gate is opened. There is no value in it. So it has no effect. Then, 0 times 1 plus 3, so the value in the memory becomes 3. Next, we look at the output gate, the input vector is 310. So the output gate is still closed, 3 cannot pass, so the output is 0. OK, for the next input vector, 410. The input is still 4. Then this 410 will open the input gate. Forget gate will also be opened. As the forget gate is opened, the value stored in the memory is 3 times 1 plus 4, which equals to 7. The output gate is still closed. So the output of the entire memory is still 0. Then what will happen for the next input vector 200? Now the input becomes 2. What will happen to this input gate? The input to the activation function is minus 10. So the result is close to 0, 0 times 2 equals to 0. The input 2 is therefore blocked by the input gate. What about the forget gate? When we feed 200 into forget gate, the input for the activation function is 10. So the forget gate is still open. Then 7 times 1 plus 0. It turns out that the value in the memory does not change, which is still 7. Then this 7 cannot be output, because the output gate is still closed. So the output is still 0. OK, next, input vector is 101. What will happen to input vector 101? The input here is still 1. The input gate is closed. What about the forget gate? So the forget gate is still the same at this time. It is opened. So the value stored in the memory remains unchanged. What about the output gate? When you input 101, you will open the output gate and the input of the activation function becomes 90. After passing activation function, we get 1. Then 1 times 7 equals to 7. So it will output a value from the memory. The value 7 in the memory will be read out. Finally, let's try 3, 1, 0. Oh. This 3 is read in as input. The input gate will be closed. What about the forget gate? Because this value is minus 1, the input for activation function of the forget gate is minus 90. The activation output is 0. So, the value stored in memory will be cleared. The value stored in the memory will be multiplied by the output of the forget gate and become 0. 
As for the output gate, it is still closed at this time, but it does not matter if it is turned on or not, because the value in the memory is zero anyway. Then the value it reads out is also zero. This is the whole process of the algorithm. Now you may wonder that. This is very different from the neural network we saw before. What kind of relationship does it have with the original neural network? You can think of it this way. There's a lot of neurons in our original neural network. We will multiply the input by different weights. Then treat them as the input for different neurons. Also, every neuron is a function. Which takes in a scalar and outputs another scalar. But what about the LSTM? You can think of the memory cell of the LSTM as a neuron. So if we want to use an LSTM network today. What you have do is to just replace a simple neuron. With a LSTM cell. And the current input x1, x2 will be multiplied by different weights. As different inputs to LSTM. That is to say, suppose we now have only two neurons in this hidden layer. That is, there are only two LSTMs, but in fact you will have more than two neurons. You may have, say, 1000 neuron and 1000 LSTM memory cells. Now suppose there are only two LSTMs, then x1, x2 are multiplied by a set of weights. To control the output gate of the first LSTM. Again, multiply it by another set of weights to control the input gate of the first LSTM. And multiply it by another set of weights to serve as the input of the first LSTM, and multiply it by another set of weights as the input of LSTM's forget gate. The second LSTM follows the same process. X1, X2 are multiplied by a set of weights to control its output, and similarly. For the output gate, for the input gate, for the input, for the forget gate. Now, we just mentioned that LSTM has four inputs and one output. And for an LSTM, the four inputs are all different. The four inputs for the first LSTM are all different and the four inputs for the second LSTM are all different. In the original neural network, a neuron has only one input and one output. In LSTM, it needs four inputs to produce an output. Just like some machines, it only needs one power cord to run the machine. For LSTM, it requires four power cords to run the LSTM machine. As LSTM needs four inputs, and the four inputs are all different, the number of parameters LSTM needs is. Assuming the network of LSTM has the same number of neuron. As in the original neural network, the number of parameters LSTM needs will be four times that of a normal neural network. From this picture, you can clearly see that the general neural network only needs this part of the parameters to generate the input for a neuron. But LSTM also needs to control three other gates, so it needs four times the parameters. But in this way, you may still have no idea how. This is related to the recurrent neural network. This picture does not seem to look like a recurrent neural network we have just learned. So, we have to draw another picture to show it. Suppose we now have a whole row of LSTM cell. In this row of LSTM cell, in each of their memory, there is a scalar stored in each LSTM cell. Concatenating all the scalars together, we will get a vector, C, T1. Each of the scalars stored in a single memory cell represents a dimension in the vector C T1. Now, at time t, input a vector, xt. This vector is first get through a linear transform, which we multiply it by a matrix to become another vector z. You multiply xt by a matrix to become z. Then z is also a vector, then what does the z vector represent? What about each dimension of this vector z? Each dimension of z this vector manipulates. The input of each LSTM. So the dimension of z is exactly. The number of memory cell. Then the first dimension of z controls the input for the first cell, the second dimension controls the second cell, and so on. 
Hope you all know what I mean. Okay, this xt will be multiplied by another transform. To get zi. And this zi, whose dimension is also the same as the number of cells. Each dimension of zi will control a memory cell. For example, the first dimension of zi controls the input gate of the first cell, the second dimension controls the input gate of the second cell, and the last dimension controls the input gate of the last cell. What about the forget gate and the output gate? It the same as before. Multiply xt by a transform to get zf, zf will control each forget gate. xt is multiplied by another transform to get zo, zo will control the output gate of each cell. Okay, so we multiply xt by four different transforms. To get four different vectors, and the dimensions of these four vectors are exactly the same as the number of cells. The four vectors combined will control the operation of these memory cells. Okay. We know that a memory cell looks like this. And the inputs are Z, ZI, ZF, ZO. Notice that these four Z are actually vectors. The value sent into the cell is actually just a dimension of each vector. Since the input of each cell comes from different dimension of the vector, their input values will be different. However, all cells can be computed together. How is it? We say that z should be multiplied by the value of zi passing through an activation function. So we first pass zi through the activation function and multiply it with z. Notice that the multiplication here is the element-wise multiplication. This zf must also get through the activation function of the forget gate. It's multiplied by the value in the cell. It is multiplied by the original value in the memory cell. Then next, add these two values together. You just add the multiplication results of zi and z. With the multiplication results of zf and c, t1. Add them up. Okay, for the output gate, zo is passed through the activation function, and is. Then multiplied with the result of the addition before. And get the final output yt. The result of the addition at this time is the value stored in the memory, which is ct. Then this process will be repeated at the next timestamp. At the next timestamp, input xt plus 1. Then, you multiply z by the input gate. You multiply the forget gate with the value stored in the memory. Then add this value to this value and multiply it by the value of the output gate. Then get the output at the next time point like this. Then you may think that this is already very complicated. If you make a slideshow yourself, it will obviously take a long long time. However, this is not the final version of LSTM. This is just a simplified version. What would a real LSTM do? It will send the output here to the next timestamp. It will make the output of this hidden layer as the input at the next timestamp. In other words, both the input at the next timestamp and the output h at the previous timestamp affects the computation of these gates. In fact, not only that, people also add another things called peephole. What is the peephole? Th peephole is to send also the value in the memory cell to the next timestamp. So when manipulating the four gates of LSTM, you consider X, H, and C at the same time. You combine these three vectors and multiply them by four different transforms to get these four different vectors. To control the LSTM. Usually, LSTM does not have only one layer. Now it's common to stack five or six layers. So it looks like this. And everyone who saw this for the first time. His reaction is like this, what have I just seen? As far as I remember, the author of the sequence to sequence model, which is proposed by Google Brain, once gave a talk to me. He said that at the first time he saw LSTM, his reaction was exactly the same as this picture. It is far too complicated. It will not work. 
Everyone I know feels that this will not work. At the first time they see LSTM. But it is actually quite standard now. So, when someone tells you that. They solve a problem with RNN, don't ask him why don't you use LSTM? Because he actually uses LSTM. Now when you say you are using RNN. You are actually referring to using the LSTM. So, this is actually quite standard. Actually Keras supports LSTM, so even if you don't understand the complicated things we have just said. You can just type in the four letters L, S, T, M in Keras. Then it's over. Keras actually supports three kinds of recurrent neural networks. One is LSTM. One is GRU. GRU is a slightly simplified version of LSTM. It only has two gates. Compared to LSTM, it has one less gate, but the performance is comparable to that of LSTM, and because of having one-third less parameters. It can prevent overfitting to some extent. If you want to use the simplest RNN we talked about at the beginning of this lesson, you have to explicitly tell Keras that you want to use the simple RNN. Then I think we can stop here today. Thank you. National Taiwan University Artificial Intelligence Center, Ministry of Science and Technology, Joint Research Center for Artificial Intelligence Technology and Full-Scale Health Care http colon slash slash